Yeah, so I mean, uh, like the first thing on the top of my mind, uh, and it might be on yours too, is the downtown stadium proposal. So that's sort of what I wanted to ask you about right off the bat. Uh, You came out in support of the downtown stadium proposal uh, recently, and I'm curious uh, why you decided to come out in support of it, but also why you sort of held off and let the dialogue play out before taking a stance. Sure. Um, I thought it was important to allow the Spokane School District to have space to have that conversation, and I felt it was important for them to take the lead on this project. I've been asked by a lot of people to um, voice a position on it, but I I wanted to give the school board and the district that time to really um, seek public input and have the conversation themselves. And so I decided the night before their decision on Wednesday, so Tuesday I came out in support of it. Um, And I, I think that it's a, I'm supporting it for a number of reasons. I think it's a win for the school district to be able to uh, save money over the course of uh, 30 years, $17.5 million with this option. Uh, I think it's a win for families and students to have a location that's more accessible. So there's an equity factor involved. I think that's a win. And I think um, being able to bring on a United um, Soccer League team here uh, would be great for economic development. And so uh, that's a win for the community. So we'll see what happens. There are more conversations that it sounds like after Wednesday's vote that will take place between the school district and public facilities district and also civic theater so that all of those who are impacted are um, happy with this decision and it's workable for everybody. Yeah, I'm curious if there would be any deal breakers for you like um, any conditions that aren't met with a downtown stadium? You know, what, what do you need to see? Obviously, folks are concerned about the Civic Theater nearby. Um, is there anything that that um, would, would, you know, nullify your support for it? Well, I can't think of anything necessarily that are deal breakers, but I know there are concerns over parking and noise levels for the Civic Theater. So I think those things are being worked out. Um, and this, you know, I'll just say this isn't my project. This isn't this is something that I think the school district really needs to take a lead on. Um, and they're using, you know, $30 million in, in bond money to, to construct the stadium. Um, so I, I'll just continue to watch the conversation and, and see how, how it all plays out. Uh, we have a question from a reader asking why the city focuses development um, and, and business support downtown. Uh, it seems like he feels like, um, especially considering the congestion and parking issues instead of elsewhere in the city. Um, A, do you feel like that's true? But B, um, you know, how how can other parts of the city be uh, supported as well? Well, the majority of our businesses are just in here. They're just downtown. Um, And so we want a downtown that um, is economically vibrant um, and is thriving. But we also have business districts that we focus attention on, whether that's Monroe or Perry or Garland or Sprague. So, so all of that is very important to our city, but, but downtown is where a lot of the economic activity happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, if I, if I can uh, attempt a smooth transition here, speaking of stadiums, we'd like to see one full again sometime soon, but the pandemic is uh, still lingering on. Uh, It looks like the latest numbers we're, we're at risk of possibly having to, uh, move back. Are you concerned about that as a possibility? I am. I, I am. I just had a, a conversation with the governor's office yesterday. Um, our cases have ticked up, especially with the younger demographic, those 29 and under, uh, seem to be getting the majority of those new cases. And our hospitalization trend that was going downward has stopped going downward. And so um, we're right on the line. For, for those two measurements with the governor's um, phased plan of moving forward. Um, in conversations with the governor's office, they're looking, uh, there's a number of, of counties across the, the state that are experiencing the same thing. Spokane County isn't the only one. And they're concerned about um, having to possibly roll back the entire state. Um, that could be devastating. Mm-hmm. So they're looking at also, uh, we're actually having conversations about putting in uh, or including a vaccine metric 
And now that, you know, statewide, anyone over the age of 16 has um, the eligibility to get a vaccine. I mean, that's where the message really needs to be is if you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated and pretty much any, you know, now anyone over 16 can get vaccinated. So really messaging that. Uh, I will be getting my, my first dose today. I wasn't eligible until just a week ago, made my appointment and will be going to Gonzaga University to check out their vaccination site as they try to uh, encourage those in that younger demographic to get vaccinated. So, and looking forward to that. Do you know if you're gonna be team Moderna or team Pfizer? That's I'll be cool. Pfizer. Ooh, yeah. ooh, sorry, Moderna folks. Um, so, I, I mean, but- if, Is there if, a better team than the other one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, depends who you ask. Um, I guess so. But if, if, vaccine, if vaccination rates are a metric, I, 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 I don't know, but I'm assuming that also doesn't look good for Spokane County right now. I mean, we're, we, we, are you concerned about vaccine hesitancy? Well, that's why I'm, I'm getting out there and encouraging people to do it. So those who are eligible now, 38% have received their first vaccine. So nearly, nearly 40%. We, we need to, we need to get that number higher. We need more of our population uh, vaccinated, but that only became available a week ago. So we have to give people time to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it, what do you fear the consequences are if we do have to roll back? Um, you know, there's like even just right off the top of my head, maybe this is because I'm a city government reporter, but you know, the parks department has worked so hard to increase mm -hmm. the number of activities it's offering people. And um, is that, you know, are some of those not possible if we have to roll back? Uh, businesses that have expanded, restaurants that have had increased capacity. Um, mm -hmm. w what's the message to them? It's hard um, because we also have, as, as businesses have been able to increase their capacity, more people are back to work. Uh, and we're providing more opportunities for people to get out and enjoy their city, entertainment options, outdoor activities. I mean, number one is, is to get outside. The weather's warmer. We need to be doing things more outside. But um, and I'll tell you what, just with a conversation that we had with the governor's office yesterday, I think I think the governor and the Department of Health sphere is if we go back, will the public still be with us? Will the public still listen to us? Um, so, again, it's just about getting getting your vaccine and following public health guidance, be outside, mask, socially distance. Um, we need to continue that. But I think um, the fatigue is set in and I think the state is very concerned about losing the public's um, adherence to all of that if we go back. How would you describe your relationship uh, and the city's relationship with the governor's office? Obviously, there have been moments where you've pushed for uh, opening and advancement um, ahead of what they had wished for. Um, but, you know, a year into this, how would you describe that working relationship? Very good. I, I meet uh, every other week with the governor's staff, and it's, it's a great conversation. Um, I think it's really important for the governor's office to hear from this side of the state. That's, I mean, that's what I've been advocating for all along. Um, sometimes I think those of us in Eastern Washington don't feel like we're, we're heard enough. And so I've been advocating to have that voice and, um, and it's worked. So I, I, I re really appreciate the fact that I, I have that um, opportunity to talk with the governor's office every other week. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that uh, comes to mind immediately this week is uh, just police accountability and reform in the wake of the uh, trial and the killing of George Floyd. And here in Spokane, after the protests last year, um, the city council and your administration pledged to have conversations, community conversations. Um, and it's been uh, almost a year now and we still haven't had those conversations. So where do we stand on, on talking about police reform? Yeah, we're meeting next month. Um, we were hoping to meet uh, earlier, but covid uh, definitely got in the way. We had um, a little bit of some contracting issues with some of our facilitators, um, but we're at a place where we're going to meet and then just uh, creating that that um, that group who was who going to be at the table with us. There was a lot of discussion in the community about that. And so we are at a place where we have the stakeholders, we have commitment, uh, and we are setting a date for for May now. To have those conversations i think it's the timing of it is good because you know a lot of the police reform that we're seeing statewide that is moving through the legislature will have been decided um, by then and um i think that will be very very helpful so things that will be passed statewide that quite frankly 
already are things that our Spokane Police Department has implemented over the years. For example, um, compelling um, officers to intervene um, when other officers are doing things that are outside of practice and policy. Um, that's something that the state just, that legislation just made it to the governor's office statewide. That's something that our police department has implemented for quite some time. But to see uh, what's, what are some things that we, that we need to address outside of what the state has decided, um, that will be the, the focus of our conversation. And, and who gets to be a part of that conversation? Uh, who's, who's involved? So um, all the representatives of our communities of color, uh, NAACP, council, myself, the police department, um, it is a good group. It's about 17, 18 people, so not too big, but but still a good size. We've got a, a facilitator from Seattle, a facilitator locally, um, to walk us through those conversations. I think the first the first meeting will be just a get to know each other type of meeting, uh, almost like a retreat, uh, so that we can develop, create a relationship, so that we can have those tough conversations. I think that's the first step. Will it be, I know from the beginning, it was stressed that this should be an in-person meeting. Is that still the goal to be yes. in person? And that's what's taken the time, to, to, to be honest with you. Um, these kinds of conversations that will be, you know, raw, they'll, they'll be honest, maybe emotional. You've got to have those at the table. I, I, this, this whole Zoom can work well right now for you and me, but, but not for these kinds of conversations. We experienced that with um, the police contract that was finally finalized after four years. That had to be done at the table, um, much more impactful, much more effective. Well, I'm glad you brought up the police contract. I wanted to ask you about that. Are you starting negotiations on the next one uh, already? Not quite. Uh, that will come very, very soon, though. I think in the next month or two. Did you, uh, I, I suppose nobody ever gets everything that they want in a negotiation, but uh, are you happy, uh, especially a, a couple of months later now, uh, and maybe have a, you have a little more time to reflect, are you happy with that contract and, and having that behind you? I am. I am. Um, and, it, and it wasn't an easy one. Uh, it was something that I inherited. And after three years of, of negotiations, it had stalled. Um, we thought we got back on track. And then um, the conversation shifted about a police accountability and relations with communities of color between police officers after the, the, the death of George Floyd. So um, we got back on track, though, after that. Uh, we made it happen. I think we, we got a lot more clarity on police oversight as far as how it aligns with our city charter. That was a, a huge, that was where all the work centered on, really. It wasn't the financials. It was it was the police accountability part of it. Um, and we are, we got, a, it got a lot stronger uh, in this last contract. Mm -hmm. um, and the other public safety issue I wanted to ask you about was the downtown precinct because we're starting, it's been open for a little while now. Uh, I think there's a little bit more activity downtown uh, than there was maybe last summer. Um, do you feel like it's working? And how do you judge if, if that precinct is working? Because, um, you know, maybe arrests isn't a great metric for public safety. Yeah, um, it, it opened in September. So it's just been, um, what, half a year or so since it's been open. Um, I think it's working. I think the businesses downtown will tell you that it is. The relationships that our officers have been able to um, establish with the business owners and the people who work downtown has been very, very positive. Um, we're giving the police department some tools, too, to, to help them be a little quicker, a little more nimble in their response to calls with uh, e-bikes. So um, I think that will be a helpful tool as, as well. But as we, as you mentioned, there has, hadn't been a lot of activity um, and then things shut down again in November. So I, I think the real test will be when the normal activity comes back. Uh, and we haven't seen that yet. Um, and I, I also wanted to ask about um, where we stand in developing a plan for uh, shelter for people experiencing homelessness um, this year, because it seems COVID obviously threw a wrench in everything um, and disrupted any sort of like re rational, reasonable planning ability. Um, but looking into later this year, are we going to face another winter where it's like a mad dash for shelter as temperatures drop or is the idea to, to have shelter ready to go? 
You know, I, I would say um, we, we've actually gained a lot of ground in our homeless plan, uh, even during COVID, maybe because of COVID. And the silver lining, you've been reporting on this, Adam, um, the silver lining in this has been that we have regional collaboration that we never had before to address this issue. This is homelessness is not just a city issue. Um, it's a regional issue and we need to have our regional partners at the table in addressing it. So I think during the health pandemic, not only did we expand our homeless um, shelter system to offer more flexibility and, and we offered shelter space throughout 2020, which we don't typically do. Um, we got flexibility from our partners to expand and offer more bed space. Uh, and we've looked at uh, now our Cannon Shelter, which was completely refurbished with CARES Act money. Um, that will be a year round shelter now. You know, before it was just a seasonal warming center, but we're looking at getting a year round provider and operator for that facility so that it would be a day shelter during the day, which we've never had. And we're going to have that this summer. And then it could, because it's got the same provider all year, can easily pivot to that uh, winter warming center, um, just depending on when the weather changes. So that's a, that's a huge change to our system. We also receive commerce money to operate a young adult shelter, and we are uh, making inroads on that as well. So right now we don't have the, the capital or a location, capital funding or a location for that, but we can still operate that by finding beds within the system for young men and young women. Um, so we're doing that as well. We also use CARES Act money uh, as a region to purchase the shelter on mission, that has been that low barrier emergency drop in during COVID with the expanded space, but we're going to be converting that or transitioning that very quickly um, into that bridge housing model, where again, we bring in the accountability part of it all, where somebody is referred to that shelter, they can be stabilized in 30, 60, 90 days, receive wraparound services for um, mental health, addiction help, job training, and then placed into permanent housing. So that's a real great program to move people out of homelessness. All of that is new and all of that happened during a global health pandemic. So I, I'm, I'm really proud of the inroads that we've made in, on the homeless issue. Tell me if you think this is unfair, but I, the system you just described does not strike me as one that would have been uh, proposed or endorsed by Nadine Woodward, candidate for mayor in 2019. Do you think you've evolved on the issue and, and learned and, and changed at all? Or uh, do you think that's unfair? And, and maybe that's, you know, this is always sort of what you envisioned. I I, I would say I've learned a lot, Adam. You're, you're right. Um, and you, you learn a lot when you're in this position. And I work very, very closely with um, our staff and uh, our, our partners and our providers um, just to learn more about what the system is and where we need to improve. Understanding more about the, the COC, the continuum of care, and what that five-year plan in homelessness looks like. All of those things I mentioned are included in that plan. So, so aligning our efforts with that plan and with our regional partners, I think is really important. So I wouldn't say that my, um, my, my, my outlook or the way I look at the issue has changed. Um, I, I've learned a lot more and I, for me, it was about the accountability part and the fact that we're moving in that direction, I think is great. The thing that I like is that the day shelter, when we have outreach, um, uh, opportunities there, that could be the intake where we actually get people referred to, uh, at the bridge housing shelter. Um, and we actually have a system now that is moving people out of homelessness and, and that's been something that I've, I, I thought has been important all along. I, uh, speaking of the young adult shelter, I know that you uh, really insisted that there be buy-in from the neighborhood, uh, one by the service provider um, mm -hmm. for that to move forward. And that's still a process that's ongoing. Um, and, you know, I've reported on some, some conflict between um, Jules Helping Hands operating this shelter um, on the South Hill and the, the surrounding neighborhood. I'm wondering, as the city seeks to provide people shelter, um, we seem to run into this conflict where there's there's trouble getting buy-in from the neighborhood, you know. Um, and so, what role, be it on Cannon Street or you know a pop-up shelter on the South Hill or a young adult shelter near the community college? What role does the city have to play in 
uh, alleviating some of that natural friction that occurs seemingly wherever a shelter is located. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, this isn't just city, this is all regional. Uh, all the work that we're doing is regional. So uh, I want to make sure that we, you know, kind of stay focused on, on that. But um, I think it's very important for the provider, for example, for the young adult shelter. I know that Volunteers of America is identified as the, the operator of that. And they do great work already with uh, Crosswalk and with Hope House and community engagement, neighborhood engagement. And so we allowed them to go ahead and, and be the, the leader in that area. And they've done some great work. Um, so it looks like uh, we're, we're looking at a possible location on the north side close to their, uh, where they will build Crosswalk 2.0, which is, of course, on a bus line and near um, a technical training, Spokane Community College, which I think is really important. So I, I think we have to have that neighborhood engagement, um, definitely from the provider. Uh, and then, um, you know, the city can help in that too. As far as the pop-up shelter that you've been reporting on, um, you know, maybe we strengthen our permitting process a little bit more um, so that that neighborhood engagement takes place before a pop-up shelter just exists, just, just you know, comes out of nowhere <laughs> and it's in the neighborhood. So I think there are some things that we can do there. Yeah. Um, and obviously this week, the results of the audit were released on the uh, CHHS department that found some deficiencies in the way that the city contracted with service providers in 2019. Um, and it, it just obviously led to a lot of questions. W what did you learn from the audit um, and, and what lessons can the city take uh, moving forward as it, as it plans for homeless shelters in the future? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when I first came into office, it was, um, you know, some of our staff that came forward and said that they were concerned that some of the processes weren't followed, practices weren't followed um, in awarding contracts, and may have felt pressured to do some things that um, they didn't feel was the right thing to do. So, um, you know, I want to be able to be a sounding board. I want to be able to listen to, to those concerns. Um, the whole purpose of the audit was the what, the what happened, what did happen, what processes weren't followed, um, and then how, how can we learn from that. So I think coming out of that, we have a robust um, system now that um, people will know what they need to do, and we'll be able to follow up on that in, in six months. And that's something that Cupid Alexander, our division director for neighborhoods, housing and human services, have been able to implement rather quickly. Um, and he's done such a great job in that division. So that is, there is clear understanding on what the practices and the policies are. Uh, this is absolutely irrelevant to absolutely everything we've been talking about, but uh, somebody will surely uh, poke me if I don't ask you about fluoride. Um, it looks like we're, we've, we've reached an, an agreement to sort of allow a study to move forward now. Um, what do you hope to get from the study of fluoridation um, as it applies to Spokane that can help you sort of make a decision moving forward? Well, I think the decision needs to be up to the voters. I will continue to advocate for an advisory vote on fluoride. Putting fluoride in our water will affect everybody in the city and uh, something that will impact everybody. And I think the voters need to be heard on that. I'm not saying whether I am an advocate of fluoride or not an advocate of fluoride. I think what the study will do, and this is the thing that changed um, on, on that area, is that um, if we don't have to pay back the study, the, the cost of, of implementing the study, if we don't go ahead, go th follow through and, and, and implement the fluoridation, I didn't want the taxpayers on the hook for that. So, so that has been resolved. But I think the study will give everybody a clearer picture of just the cost involved in infrastructure and in operation. And I don't think, um, you know, that was done several years ago. I think those costs have gone up. And if, and if that helps people make a, a decision when an advisory vote happens on whether or not they want their city water fluoridated, I think that will be helpful. But as you said, it's an advisory vote. So theoretically, the city council could vote to require fluoride be added to the water. And then you theoretically, like, <laughs> could be put in a position where you have to decide whether or not to veto that that action, I would I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, mean, I, I know that the councilmatically, the council can do this, the Supreme Court has said they can. Um, just because you can do something, I don't 
doesn't necessarily mean you should. And I think you need to listen to the voters. Mm -hmm. So I will continue to advocate on that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also wildly irrelevant to everything. Um, but home prices are just like skyrocketing here. And I don't know, like theoretically, I'm like a 30 year old person who like <laughs> is thinking about buying a house. Like uh, people are just being sort Good of luck. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, people are just being shut out of the market. Well, what can the city yeah. do to address the like just ridiculous housing market that we're in right now? And is that one of those things that has sort of been on the back burner during COVID? Well, I mean, no, work is, has continued on that issue, too. Um, excuse me. Um, the city has uh, done a needs assessment and um, our Spokane um, housing action plan is about ready to be released. So I'm really looking forward to the recommendations that will come from that. Um, you know, there are, the, the city is kind of, our hands are tied because of federal and, and state regulations. But I think there are some things that, that we can do. I know the city council is working on um, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and what that would look like. I think that would be great in some neighborhoods. I think we have to identify where we can see um, or where the city would accept more, more density. I mean, downtown is, is an obvious place that, that we can focus on. Um, I, I look forward to the opportunity, and I think we should really be looking into this, is as um, the economy opens up more and we find that not everybody needs to be back in um, their business place, that they'll continue to telecommute from home, uh, how much office space are we going to have that's, that will be vacant? And will that provide an opportunity? for developers to transition office space into residential. And that would obviously likely happen downtown. But I think that's a great opportunity that we should seize on. And what incentives that we could provide de developers for the, for that type of, of, of development. Yeah. But there are, there are some other things. I think maybe some more flexibility in zoning. Um, I think you know not every neighborhood's gonna want density, that we have a lot of historic neighborhoods that wanna preserve that character. So maybe the ADUs will be more acceptable in those neighborhoods. But which neighborhoods um, we can identify that will be more open to creative um, options and housing? You know, the townhomes and the fourplexes and things like that. Well, and, and I was going to say, like, how do you balance? It seems like inherently you and every other elected official is going to be forced to balance the desires of uh, people who already own property or already live in a neighborhood and really want it to stay that way, um, mm -hmm. stay as is. And then, you know, you, you're, you're surely getting pressure from home builders who think we need to add more homes. And, and uh, uh, that is inherently going to change the, um, you know, feel of a neighborhood. Um, how, how do you balance needs of existing residents and desires of existing residents to have a really nice, comfortable five minute commute from the South Hill to work versus people yeah. who want to buy a house and can't find one right now? Yeah. Well, those are conversations that we're having right now. Um, and so we'll see which neighborhoods would be more open to something that's more innovative or more creative. Um, do we need another Kendall Yards? And where would that be um, for that type of, of dense housing and, and, and neighborhoods? Um, I know our, our needs assessment indicated that we need more attainable housing. We need more entry level housing. We need more of that middle, uh, missing middle housing. We need all of it. And then when seniors are empty nesters uh, or they retire and they want to sell their five bedroom, three bath home on a double lot, where do they go? So there, those are all considerations that um, that we're looking at right now. Is Kendall Yards um, or, or anything else like an example you look to that that you say that worked? You know, that's that's development that works like that's that's what I want to see more of. Where we're applicable, yeah. I think is definitely a success. Absolutely. Uh, we took a you know a brownstone and and made it a thriving uh, mixed use neighborhood. So yeah, I, I think that's a great success story for our city. Um, this will be my last question, uh, but I just I have to know uh, we're considering getting a new city flag. Did you vote <laughs> for a new city flag? And if so, <laughs> listen, I, you're entitled to your privacy. But did you choose what like which design did you choose? Uh, I'm, I'm not saying yet, so I, I'll we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll see what what. Uh, actually, one of our staff really liked the marmot with the um, what was it coming out of it? The lasers. What was it? The lasers. Yeah, the lasers and the marmot. Uh, that didn't make the final cut, but 
Well, you heard it here, folks. Uh, email the mayor with your favorite flag design. Try to sway her opinion. Just flood her Twitter, you know. I don't get to decide this one, you know. Yeah, I, I, well, <laughs> it's important. Your endorsement is Do important. Do you have a favorite, Adam? Uh, I, you know, that's, as a journalist, I have to remain objective. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Adam. Have a have a have a great day. You too. Thanks.